Martin. I am Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at the Warren Alpert Medical School here at Brown University. And I'm also the director of our new Humanitarian Innovation Initiative. And this uh, event tonight is co-sponsored by our Humanitarian Innovation Initiative, or HI Squared, as we call it, along with the Africa Initiative, which uh, Dr. Smith will be talking a little bit more about. Uh, the Humanitarian Innovation Initiative was just launched this past October with the goal of bringing together faculty, students, and alumni at Brown University who are working in the humanitarian sphere uh, to collaborate from across different disciplines and also to work uh, both across professions from academia into the humanitarian professionals and development professionals working on disaster preparedness and response and recovery across the world. Um, so we work to promote research collaborations, to promote trainings for Brown students as well as for others around the world, and also to look at developing policy and collaborations in this sphere. So as part of that, this is our first of a spring speaker series. We're going to have several other events uh, later this semester, one focused on Syria and the humanitarian <coughs> crisis there, and then another one focused on Yemen, and a final one focused on Colombia and the peace process, uh, as well as transitional justice there later this year. So we're really excited uh, to be joined by some incredible panelists today. I'll be speaking uh, at the end, but first we'll be joined by uh, Dr. Daniel Smith, who is professor and chair of the Department of Anthropology here at Brown University. Uh, Daniel Smith joined Brown in July 2001, and he has won the 2008 Margaret Mead Award for a culture of corruption, everyday deception, and popular discontent in Nigeria. He conducts research in medical anthropology, anthropological demography, and political anthropology in sub-Saharan Africa. And his research interests include HIV AIDS, reproductive health and behavior, adolescent sexuality, marriage, kinship, and rural urban migration. Um, we're going to have him starting uh, with the first part of this talk about his experiences in Sierra Leone and the social impact of Ebola there. Um, after all of the panelists speak, we'll ask you to hold your questions at the end of each panelist. And after all three of us speak, then we'll have a series of questions for the last half of this at the end. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, Adam. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, one of the other hats I wear besides being chair of the anthropology department is that I'm directing the new Africa initiative here at the Watson Institute. And so we've launched a, an exciting set of activities that we think is going to be great to bring Africa more to the forefront of our uh, consciousness and, and work at Brown University. Um, and we've already had some activities this semester. Uh, the next one after this, the next big one after this, is a, a conference on education in Africa that's going to take place on Friday, March 10th, all day in this same venue. Um, there's a listserv which we maintain and send out all the announcements about the Africa Initiative to interested people. If you're not on that listserv and you'd like to be so, uh, please just feel free to let me know or give me a piece of paper at the end of the evening or send me an email and I'll add you to the listserv. So, um, so we each have 15 minutes. I'm going to be speaking very quickly or very briefly about uh, what I have to talk about, which is to think more about the social impact of Ebola. And I'm going to be talking about Sierra Leone, but I think many of the things that I have to say about Sierra Leone would probably be true, are probably true in Liberia and Guinea as well. Um, my background in Sierra Leone is that in the mid-1980s, I was a Peace Corps volunteer, volunteer there for three and a half years. And so I'm, I'm not an expert on Ebola. I'm not an anthropologist who's an expert on Sierra Leone. In fact, it was kind of coincidental that I ended up uh, being in Sierra Leone when Ebola unfolded. I had decided that it was 30 <laughs> years since I'd begun my experience in the Peace Corps uh, in 2014. And I'm like, OK, I'd been back. The last time I'd been back was 10 years before that. It just seemed appropriate that I would go back in the summer of 2014. So I made all those plans in like February and March of 2014. By the time I was ready to go in July, Ebola was happening, but I was going to a village in the far north of Sierra Leone. It didn't seem to be very heavily affected. So I was like, OK. I'm still going to go. So I went, and, um, and part of what I'll tell you is based on my experience there as the, as the epidemic was ramping up. But, but most of what I want to tell you about is what I know and understand about the social impact of the epidemic 
based on all those years of being a Peace Corps volunteer, based on my perspective as an anthropologist who's worked for 25 years in West Africa, primarily in Nigeria, and also based on the work of other scholars who are more directly experts on culture and society and so on in Sierra Leone. So the first thing to say, as most of you probably already know, um, especially those of you who are in Adam's class and just sat through his lecture, um, I mean, the Ebola epidemic in Sierra Leone was, and in, in Liberia and, and Guinea was unprecedented in its scale. And it was unprecedented in the kinds of places where it unfolded. It was really the first Ebola epidemic that had many of its victims in big cities, including Conakry in, in Guinea, Freetown in Sierra Leone, and um, Monrovia in Liberia. Thousands of people infected, thousands of people die uh, on a scale kind of completely eclipsing anything that we'd seen anywhere else in the continent. Um, the first messages about Ebola in, in Sierra Leone uh, were that uh, people were, that, 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 that Sierra Leoneans heard about Ebola was that it was something that had happened on the border with Guinea. It was a place where people ate a lot of bush meat. So one of the main things you needed not to do in order to contract Ebola was to eat bush meat. And it took a, a longer period of time before the degree to which the human to human contact was seen to be the primary mechanism of transition. And that created a lot of initial problems. And, and, <coughs> and the fact that it was based on touching people, either dead bodies or caring for people who were sick that were the, ended up being recognized to be the main modes of transmission. It, it's those two facts that, that connect closely with what I want to tell you about the social impact of the epidemic. And I think the social impact of the epidemic is worth thinking about for two reasons. One, we don't just care about human societies because of health. We don't just care about people because of their medical problems. We care about them as full human beings, or at least we should. And so there's something to be said in and of itself <coughs> for recognizing, understanding, and trying to deal with the social impact of, of an epidemic, whether it's Ebola or anything else. But then secondly, and importantly, for the health and humanitarian side of the equation, understanding the social dimensions of the epidemic, the social consequences of the epidemic, is absolutely crucial for making the medical and public health response effective as well. So one thing I can... So when I went to Sierra Leone in July of 2014, and I talked to people who knew things about the Ebola epidemic, and I talked to Ministry of Health people when I arrived in Freetown, people's messages was, well, you'll be fine. Just don't let anyone touch you, right? <laughs> and of course, that's not even a very good message for Ebola prevention, because you don't get Ebola just by touching anyone. You only get it by touching someone who's kind of in the, what's often known as the wet phase of the, of the, of the disease. Uh, ordinary touching of people who don't have Ebola is of no risk whatsoever. Chances are, unless you're caring for a sick person or, um, or, or washing a dead body or something like that, chances are daily human-to-human -human physical contact is not going to affect you in some health-related way. And in fact, the idea that you wouldn't touch, that I wouldn't be touched or that you wouldn't touch people in Sierra Leone, I was like, oh, that's really going to work well. I haven't been there for 10 years. I'm going back to this village where I love all these people so much. Yeah, they're not going to, we're not going to touch each other, right? And of course, I just, you know, took a, these are just random pictures that I took in, in the village. Just a sense of how much people touch each other. I mean, like compared to our society, people touch each other a lot. It's constant. I mean, everyone is always touching each other. Um, you know, men touching men, children touching children, women touching women, even men and women touching each other sometimes. Um, so the idea that this was, that, that somehow you could create some simple intervention that would, or a simple set of messages that would get people to stop touching each other was a much more radical idea than you might imagine when you think, well, all you got to do is kind of wash your hands and make sure you don't shake hands. And I mean, to, in this society, the idea that people who live in the same villages and the same households and the same spaces with each other wouldn't touch each other was pretty hard to imagine that people could, could do. Um, and of course, for me, you know, there I was in Sierra Leone. I mean, this is just one example of being touched hundreds, thousands of times just in the, the two weeks that I was there. Um, I put this in just to, to, to flag something that I want to get across to you as an anthropologist talking about the social responses to the epidemic, which was that the initial messages, not by people like Adam, who, who, who understand exactly how Ebola is transmitted and, and what's going on are sensitive to the social situation, but, but the initial messages in the media and in some of the public health world were not the right messages. I mean, they, 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 if you read the newspaper articles that were coming out in the United States and around the world when the, the epidemic first started, it made it sound like it was people's culture that, that, that infected them with Ebola. So things like bushmeat, traditional burial rites. I'm going to come back in a moment to say a bit more about burial because they were so, the, the burials were in fact such important engines for transmission, but they were also primary arenas in which understanding the social basis of the disease and the social consequences of the disease are absolutely important for thinking about how 
success was eventually achieved in combating the epidemic, but also how we might think more generally about the relationship between social circumstances and epidemiology. So this idea that it was somehow <coughs> people's culture, that there was something peculiar about West African traditions and, and the primitive nature of village life and, and burials and things that people did, it was a wrong-headed approach. And it was an approach that, frankly, led to some of the alienation that people in places like Guinea and Sierra Leone and Liberia initially felt toward not only outside interveners, because initially there weren't that many outside interveners, but to the interveners from their own societies who were pitching these messages to them that somehow they were to blame, their traditional practices were to blame for, for what they were experiencing with, with Ebola. So here's an example of one of the, the <coughs> sort of um, message uh, posters that was produced. I, I think this one is I took in Sierra Leone around the epidemic. And you know some of the messaging is, is, is OK, but some of it, you know, it doesn't look, I mean, some of it, when you see it, it's, you can imagine that if you're an ordinary Sierra Leonean seeing this, you would think, oh, they're telling us that we can't do the things that we normally do. They're telling us that it's our practices that are bad. It's our culture that is bad. Without accounting for the reasons why we do the things we do, without accounting for the, the profoundly social dimensions of the kinds of behaviors, meaningful social dimensions of the kind of behaviors that we typically engage in. Go up, please. So even while I was in Sierra Leone, and again, this is July, August, the epidemic really took off in Sierra Leone in the fall. I mean, it was there starting in the spring, but it really took off right around the time I was there and reached its peak in the fall of 2014. Um, you could already see the sort of material consequences. And in fact, you know, in walking around the streets of Freetown, I mean, you wouldn't normally see people selling plastic gloves or so many different kinds of uh, uh, disinfectants and so on. Um, and for, for, for some traders, it was sort of a boon. Everywhere you went, you saw, you know, increasingly, even just during the three or four weeks I was there, households that didn't have a bucket with chlorinated water in it. So suddenly lots of households had buckets with chlorinated water in it. So very on a, a, a profoundly kind of local cultural change that people were um, embarking on. This was one of the funniest things during my initial d days in Sierra Leone where, you know, greetings in Sierra Leone are these extensive kind of handshakes. Everyone shakes hands. If you meet someone you don't shake hands, you're somehow not behaving very well. And so Sierra Leoneans came up with this, this kind of half serious, half mocking response to the messages about touching people in greetings, which was that everyone should do the elbow uh, and in fact, if you Google it, you'll find like parodies of it on, I don't know, the Comedy Channel or something like that. It became something in the media here as well. Um, important thing to say is that if you introduce, and this isn't just the case with Ebola. I mean, you know, I've, I've worked on AIDS in Nigeria for a long time. You see similar kinds of things. If you introduce an epidemic into a society that people don't totally understand, um, they come up with a lot of interpretations to try to explain what's going on. And, and those interpretations range from, range from the humorous, like the elbow greetings that I mentioned a second ago, to much more serious and sometimes much more worrisome interpretations as well. Um, in Sierra Leone, I saw this one doesn't quite exactly represent it. It shows you that Pentecostal churches were involved in some of the messaging around Ebola. But I, I, I mean, there's a, a, a famous, some of the messaging was terrible. Um, there's a famous uh, Nigerian evangelist named T.B. Joshua who basically said that he had water, holy water that he blessed, that he, would, he could send plane loads up to Sierra Leone and everyone would be just fine, right? And it's important when you, when you see these kinds of responses that look on their face ludicrous or on their face completely irrational to realize that, that, that in the context of the extreme uncertainties and frankly the confusion of some of the messaging that was coming from the government and from the public health world, uh, that, that these kinds of responses make sense in their own ways and we have to take them seriously and not just dismiss them because if we dismiss them, we miss the opportunities to understand the sociologics that are behind them. <coughs> so I want to just close with saying a few words about, um, about the ways in which the response to the epidemic in Sierra Leone, the social response was actually part and parcel of the success of, and this is certainly true in Liberia and, and Guinea as well, uh, though I don't know those cases as well, as well um, was, was part and parcel of the success, the medical, science, epidemiological, public health success of, of, of um, combating and bringing to an end the epidemic. There's an anthropologist named Paul Richards, British anthropologist who's worked in Sierra Leone for you know, probably 30 years and uh, mostly worked on agriculture and innovation. But after the Ebola epidemic, he went back and did this study to try to put into, pra to put into practice a kind of 
theoretical perspective that he'd entertained for a long time, which is that there's this notion of a kind of people science and that people, people in every culture have a capacity to see the world, analyze it, and act on it in these rational ways. And so his book, which I just read over the last course of the last week or so, is a, is a kind of classic anthropological account in the sense that it, it, it brings to bear the anthropological perspective, giving you the sense of what's going on from the, from the point of view of the people who are living in the society where something is happening. It brings an, an anthropological perspective to understanding what it was that people in Sierra Leone eventually learned often with the help and assistance of, of, of outside uh, aid and so on, but often on their own, about the Ebola epidemic that helped contribute to the eventual uh, control. I just want to say a few things about, about burials, um, because they did, the, 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 the complex thing about burials and Ebola is that, is, is that on the one hand, the message that burials were the problem was a classic example of the international and local public health community not fully understanding the social context of what was going on. So to tell people that it's the way you're burying and implying that it's somehow primitive or irrational or African in this exotic way, to, to tell people that the way you're burying is, is the problem and you have to do these safe burials. And oh, by the way, safe burials mean we're going to come in and bury the bodies for you. We're going to dump them in mass graves. We're going to wrap them in plastic. We're going to make sure you can't touch the dead person who you're mourning. Um, proved in initially to be a really insensitive, really wrong-headed way of going about addressing the problem. And yet the reality was that something had to be done to address burials because dead bodies were, dead bodies in Ebola are even more dangerous than living bodies in many circumstances with the, with, with the disease. So what Paul Richards argues in his book <coughs> is that there were kind of two main arenas in which it took time for local people to learn and adapt and for the international response to learn and adapt. And one of those is around burials and the other is around home care. And in both cases, the messages of the international community and the medical authorities in the countries evolved and changed over time to, you know, arguably a comment. So this is, this, this is you know, more what a traditional, this is a, it happens to be a Muslim burial. You can see lots of people Many of those people would have involved in touching, kissing, washing, saying goodbye to the body, and then an Ebola burial where you know people aren't really allowed to be nearby. The people burying the body are in these strange suits. Often they're outsiders. There was huge clamoring. Paul Richard shows in his book for for community training so that communities could themselves learn how to safely bury bodies. Right. Similar thing happened with regard to home care. The overwhelming message early in the epidemic and almost throughout, but moderated over time, sorry, moderated over time was, was that you shouldn't do home care. And yet the reality was that many people were left with no other choice but then to do home care. And so over time, he shows in the book that, that the, the, the authority, the medical authorities, both international and domestic, kind of realized that they had to give some kind of messaging about how you could handle situations where you simply didn't have the option of getting uh, you know, sort of expert outsider care. So, um, so if I were to sum up, and this is, this is Paul Richard's language, not mine, if I were to sum up the message of this book, and I think one of the messages that I want to leave with you as an anthropologist thinking about the social responses to Ebola in Sierra Leone and arguably much more widely, um, what we can do is, what we imagine we have to do is to, is to realize that villagers can learn and did learn and do learn to think like epidemiologists, and epidemiologists can learn and should learn how to think like villagers. So um, that's just a cartoon that I used in my class, not a cartoon, a sort of fake, new fake news before we knew about fake news uh, in The Onion, which, which, which suggested that uh, this, this is something that came out in the fall of 2014, basically suggesting that it was only when enough white people died that the West would care enough to invest the money to, to uh, invent a vaccine that would prevent Ebola. And while lots of money and lots of effort and lots of great people from the West, including from the West, have dedicated their time and their money and their lives to trying to do something about Ebola, this message is still a real message, right? We still, I mean, I don't think you can, I don't think anybody could make the argument convincingly to me that somehow in the United States of America we care as much about African lives as we care about white American lives, and that's still a problem. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So next up, we have Dr. Michelle Nasarenko, who is 
a pediatric emergency medicine physician and director of the Global Health Program at Boston Children's Hospital. She has experience in pediatric care and program development in China, Bolivia, Lesotho, Guatemala, Liberia, Indonesia, Uganda, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Syria. And in Liberia, she provided pediatric humanitarian aid uh, in the post-conflict setting after uh, Liberia's civil war, developing partnerships with U.S. academic institutions for the past eight years. Through these partnerships, sustainable programs for the health system, rebuilding, including physician education and care for vulnerable children, were developed in Liberia. In 2014 to 2015, during the Ebola outbreak, she led the Liberian hospital public health response, utilizing a rapid deployment model and training for local healthcare workers. This work continues into Liberia's recovery phase with implementation of a national program for hospital quality improvement and emergency care training. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to her to talk more directly about the response from the clinical side to the uh, Ebola epidemic. Thank you guys. I'm really happy to be here and talk to you guys about the health system response. I think it parallels nicely to what you just heard. You'll see a lot of crossover about healthcare workers and their beliefs in the health system, as well as patients then seeking or not seeking care. And so, um, so the first message, just like my colleague said, is Ebola is real. So the healthcare workers didn't believe it either in the beginning. And so the educational message had to permeate not just communities, but the health and medical system for a disease that they'd never seen before. And so um, no financial disclosures, and then all the photos you're about to see are all taken with uh, permission. Um, so our problem in Liberia is that before Ebola, it was a very crowded, low supply, understaffed place with limited space for patients. And so when I was there in the summer of 2014, getting ready to launch our residencies, we were already struggling with these infrastructure challenges. But then by September, the capital city of Monrovia, which has 1.5 million people, all the hospitals had closed and there was not a single hospital to seek care just two months later because of the epidemic. All the healthcare workers had been exposed, people were in quarantine, and the patients were afraid to come. And so while the world was talking about Ebola treatment units, which Adam is going to talk more about the Ebola uh, specific response, the most dangerous place to be in the country was actually in their public hospitals. And so our work focused on healthcare workers. So 389 healthcare workers lost their lives to Ebola. This included many friends and colleagues of mine teaching faculty, our residents, our medical students, nurses we'd worked with for years. And so these guys were on the front lines fighting an enemy they didn't really know what it was or what to do about. And so the response started relatively early in Liberia. The government was relatively transparent. The CDC was kind of first on scene, um, and they launched the U.S. incident management system as far as organizing a response. Um, they started this over the summer, and then by September, UNMIR, the UN mission for emergency Ebola response, had also moved in when the world really mobilized to respond. And so an IMS system, which is our U.S. structure for any of you guys who are doing emergency management as part of your public health or have participated, <laughs> is a complex structure of management that divides responsibilities, tries to create a clear chain of command. This is very different than the UN cluster system, which many of you are learning about or participate in through the humanitarian response framework, where clusters like health, shelter, food, water, sanitation, all get activated to provide an organized system. And so we had the Liberian IMS system with a cluster system on top of it, and the whole world actors present to then take care of the health system. But in this typical system, the health system is usually not involved. It's sort of assumed to be not functioning or to be lost, like the Haiti earthquake. Many of healthcare workers were killed and weren't there to actually staff it. In Liberia, most of the Ministry of Health was still there and available. And so for us in the hospitals, it left IPC, or Infection Prevention and Control, which was the most important way to prevent Ebola from spreading, without really a home in this response. And so it became a task force that lived in this incident management system. And so the partners all came together. This was CDC, WHO, <coughs> international governmental, non-governmental organizations, and then academics like ourselves. And so for us, you know, we had worked in the Liberian hospital systems for eight years prior to the outbreak. So we knew the challenges, we knew the people, knew the landscape. And so we were able as partners to devise a solution to train, supply, mentor, and improve 
at a rapid scale to try to make hospitals safe very quickly. The challenge for us is that you had to do it nationally because Ebola was like that needle in the haystack moving around and no matter where it showed up you had to be ready. And so if we did anything less than a national response we would have left kind of holes in the security of Ebola getting through. So our partnership came together, a group of universities who would all work together, and basically we're funded by the Paul Allen Foundation to sort of launch this academic response. And our goal was to take training, couple it with supply, mentor it, and try to improve the environment. And so our package took a government package that was being rolled out nationally to Liberian healthcare workers, many friends and colleagues of mine. We trained them as the experts to communicate in the local English dialect sent them out as the ambassadors for this programming to their peers and colleagues in hospitals to do the training. And we did it in a very embedded model, so we send each team to each hospital for a week to really dive in, work alongside their healthcare worker peers, try to show them, don't be afraid we have the equipment and supplies and the knowledge to do this safely. And then we've repeated it every eight weeks across every hospital, and there's 23 public hospitals. We tried to take the teaching methods and make them fun, so hands-on, songs, donning and doffing until everybody was sick of donning and doffing. Um, we created a hand wash jingle, gloves on, gloves off. We also really focused on the lower educated healthcare workers. So of those healthcare worker infections, a third of them were actually the cleaners. Cleaners, security, kitchen, laundry, who were basically ignored by the response or unprotected. We also focused on making sure our approach was local. So this is one of my teams, we have five of them, um, and so they were the ones who delivered this intervention <coughs> to their peers, so it was perceived as local. But then our other problem was, is if we showed up with just the training and not the supplies to do what we taught you, then we didn't really help you. And so this intervention had to come with a massive logistic effort. And so Ebola, as you've seen, is a very resource intensive disease. All that PPE, the gloves, the chlorine, and if your supply chain is not functioning, it's very hard to make this intervention. So we took it outside into the response mode, partnered with our colleagues in logistics expertise in MIT to look at how many gloves does a Liberian hospital need for a six-month period of time? Like, what is that? We don't know. And so we did some planning. What this turned out to be was 80 tons of PPE. So I essentially got an airplane for Christmas in 2014 um, full of PPE that then immediately had to go to the hospitals. And so what that looks like is a lot of boxes on a lot of trucks in a big warehouse that then has to move. And it's got to move quickly. And so we used an all local team who had the connections to work with the airport, with the government, to move these supplies as quickly as we could in partnership with the UN. And so when we did this, we went 72 hours from plane hits the tarmac to supplies at the largest public hospital in the country. And that very night, a nine-year-old girl with Ebola went through the hospital, and none of the healthcare workers got Ebola, because we said, we showed up and we said, we're serious about your safety, we see your empty warehouses, we're going to teach you how to protect yourself, but we're going to give you the stuff to do it. And so on unpacking day, as our teams like to call it, everybody, this is one of our nurses, everybody unpacks boxes, and it's part of the team effort. So we had to move three truckloads into every hospital and get it out into circulation as quickly as we could. And then the other problem we have is that, you know, during a response, many times responders show up with a package. This is what we have to offer you. Take it or leave it. And in this scenario, each hospital had different needs. Some had broken water pumps, can't wash your hands if there's no water. Some had no place to dry their equipment and they needed racks or drying materials. And so we came with each team with a disposable amount of cash that they could work with the hospital leadership and decide what are your problems, prioritize for us, and until we hit zero dollars, we'll fix those. And so our teams went through and worked on waste. So we encountered piles of hazardous waste all over the country, because this is a system that had been very uh, PPE light prior to Ebola. And so we took this and we turned it into sustainable solutions. So instead of just digging a hole, we actually took those phones and we put in proper burn pits that will last up to two years, so the hospitals have a solution. We tried to look at the water. This is actually one of the water's, hospital's water source. Um, we couldn't fix this because it's a stream. Um, but in other places, we were able to take old pumps that were not functioning and get them rehabilitated and ready to go so that the healthcare workers had access to water as a way to make sure that this was a sustainable solution. 
We also went out into the communities around the hospitals because the patients seeking care were down about 65 percent. And so if we've made the hospital safe again, we need to let the communities know. And so we engage folks from the social mobilization task force, the psychosocial community, and then our staff included a reverend, an imam, a gender-based violence counselor, and an HIV counselor. And they went out and tried to message, your hospital is safe, you can come back, come get vaccinated, deliver in healthcare facility. And so as we did this, we also, since we're academic, focused on trying to measure our outcomes. And so we used a Ministry of Health standard assessment to look at each facility, how it's performing over time, try to target those weaknesses. And so as we did this, we found that a lot of the infrastructure things were the problem. So we couldn't do huge fixes for power, new wells, um, security fencing to direct flow of patients. And so this was a big call to action for the donors. And in our follow-up work right now, we were able to convince the Centers for Disease Control, who don't necessarily, aren't known for digging wells, um, to actually renovate the full wash facilities for hospitals as part of a sustainable solution for this surveillance barrier. And so as we did this, we really realized in the recovery phase that the fear and distrust was widespread between the patients and the healthcare workers. And if your emergency room looks like this, there's not a lot of incentive to come to the hospital for care. And so as part of the post-outbreak recovery, the government developed a national investment plan with nine pillars where they placed the priorities for their money to be invested as part of the post-response funding. And as part of that, they wanted to maintain a strong workforce, strong infection control, surveillance, update that infrastructure, especially around water and sanitation, address the supply chain issues. And so in partnership with the government in our response work post the outbreak, we developed a package partnering with them to then take on these challenges. And so the government developed a <coughs> training package called Safe Quality Healthcare Services to blend infection control with everyday emergency care and try to bring up the skills of the healthcare workers around emergency response. And so we rolled out that training nationally um, in partnership with WHO and the other implementers at the clinic and health center level to then train folks using modern teaching methods. So we incorporated simulation, we incorporated case-based learning to try to make this training exciting and interesting. Um, and as we did that, we set the bar pretty high to look at the subject's knowledge and that their performance on how they learned and the healthcare workers. And we did this now, we switched models instead of our teams who are Liberian, but they come from the capital, they go out, they come back, they go out, they come back. And in 15 rural counties where it takes two days to drive across a space the size of Tennessee, the response needed to be locally owned. And so we built a system of mentors and champions within each hospital facility to receive the training from our teams and then carry it forward in their own hospital as the sort of leaders within the hospital. And so as we did that, we moved across the country delivering this emergency care training program. We also provided the emergency care supplies to go with it. 50% of the hospitals in the country had no access to oxygen prior to, the, to this training package. And so giving them what they needed to apply that training was really powerful. As we did this, there were evaluation methods set forward by WHO, by the Ministry of Health. We continue to evaluate. Now we're about a year on um, as we do this. Um, we ended up training about nearly 4,000 hospital workers across the country in all 15 counties. Um, when we looked at their test performance, the initial goals set for them in learning this new material and performing by the WHO was 10% knowledge gain. They really managed to blow us out of the water with the average clinical participants gaining 46% more knowledge um, post the training package and then actually taking it and applying it. And so as they did, this is sort of our knowledge gain graph, um, but as they did this, we also had them perform sort of simulated scenarios to see how they'd respond to the same cases over time. And for every sort of chunk of knowledge they gained, about 10% testing points, they would on average do one to two more clinical tasks better. And so we hope that this has actually improved patient care and a year out, we're actually monitoring how this has improved patient care. So we have data collection going on throughout all 25 hospitals to look at what this intervention did as far as performance by the healthcare workers. And so we um, overall felt like with this training intervention, it was risky. You know, you can do training and then it can do nothing. Uh, or you can do training and you can do mentorship afterwards and see how well it takes. And so we're now at a phase that despite kind of all these challenges, this is one of the roads 
This is actually a reasonable road in Lofa. Um, and so despite these challenges, we're now a year post this massive training effort across the country where we now have a system of embedded mentors that the Ministry of Health is now running centrally from their quality management unit while we're also tackling water and sanitation renovations. And then we have a team working with the uh, supply chain unit at the Ministry of Health to improve their sort of supply chain turnaround time and mentor the pharmacists and dispensers to use the forums and be able to turn around in real time and address the hospital's needs as part of the mentorship. Um, we have a huge team. Um, this is our international team, but then more importantly, we have a massive <coughs> local team. Um, this is only about half the team because we're never all in the same place at any one time, but we have about 75 local staff ranging from my religious community leaders to doctors, nurses, and PAs to water and sanitation techs um, to even up to our drivers who end up becoming field procurement officers building burn pits. And so with that, um, I would leave you with a picture of what is a beautiful country. Uh, that doesn't often get seen, and I'll look forward to questions on the panel. <laughs> All right, thank you. So I'll finish it up and try to be as brief as I can. So I'm going to talk a little bit more from the perspective of the international humanitarian response, but also the perspective of lessons learned and what we can take out of this response. So I initially arrived in Liberia. I hadn't ever worked there before, actually, but I initially arrived in Liberia in August of 2014. I came as part of the emergency response team for International Medical Corps, which is a US-based humanitarian organization that I've worked with for about six or seven years. I'd responded with them to many other emergencies prior to that. I was in uh, <coughs> Haiti after the earthquake. I was in Libya during the conflict there. Responded a couple times in South Sudan. But this was certainly my first time responding to an Ebola outbreak. And it was International Medical Corps' first time responding to an Ebola outbreak. And for almost every single responder, both local and international, it was their first time responding to an Ebola outbreak. So there's a whole lot that had to be learned quickly. I initially arrived in Liberia in August of 2014, and we opened up our first Ebola treatment unit uh, for International Medical Corps <coughs> in Bong County, Liberia, on September 15, 2014. And I can tell you that that by itself was one of the busiest months and hardest months of my entire life. Um, as you can imagine, there was a incredible amount of pressure at the time from the Ministry of Health and Social Welfare and from the local communities to open up our Ebola treatment unit as quickly as possible because the numbers of cases were increasing rapidly in Liberia at the time. And yet at the same time, there was all these things that had to be put in place first. We had to first build the Ebola <coughs> treatment unit, of course. We had to train up our staff. Um, Ninety percent of the staff working in our Ebola treatment unit were local Liberians. Um, who had also never managed or treated Ebola before and had to be trained not just in how to care for patients with the disease, but also how to protect themselves. I will also say that uh, of the 10 percent of our staff that was expatriate, more than half of those were from other African countries. In fact, there was a period in time in which we had more Kenyans than Americans working in our Ebola treatment unit. And so it's very much lost um, that the international humanitarian response doesn't mean necessarily a lot of white people rushing in. In fact, most of the international humanitarian response was also people from the region who were responding to help. Um, we had to source our PPE, or personal protective equipment, which, as was mentioned, uh, is very expensive. A lot of it had to be brought in from outside the country, which was really hard at the time because international supplies had largely sold out. Um, and we also had to develop our clinical protocols <laughs> which for me as a medical doctor and as the first uh, medical director of our first Ebola treatment unit, a lot of the work in finalizing our protocols fell to me and I found it incredibly difficult because unlike almost every other disease out there, there was almost no research into what are the proper ways to diagnose and treat this disease. There had been almost no studies ever published prior to this outbreak. And so that raised a lot of alarms for me in terms of uh, what we're really missing here and 
how much we can learn from this epidemic. And the final aspect of what we had to do, and this actually might seem like an afterthought in the setting of this massive epidemic with all these people dying and opening up your Ebola treatment unit, but the last thing we had to do, which proved to be really important, was creating a system for documenting patient <coughs> care. And this improved, proved to be very important for the patients in our Ebola treatment unit because it was really important for us to keep track of uh, their symptoms, of the treatments we were giving them, of how they were doing. But it also proved to be even more important for what we learned from this epidemic uh, because of the fact that we had almost no information about this disease going into the epidemic. Almost everything we know today about Ebola was through data that was collected during the Ebola epidemic in West Africa from 2014 to 2015. And yet collecting that data was really hard because everything that went into the high-risk zone of our Ebola treatment unit essentially couldn't come out. Everything had to be burned before it came out. And that meant all of the patient records that we wrote on all of the patients ended up being burned at some point uh, before we shut down our treatment units. And so getting data out became a very big problem and was one of the things that uh, International Medical Corps especially thought that it wanted to do. And so actually that was the second piece of how I became involved in the epidemic was as my time uh, responding to the um, epidemic initially with International Medical Corps came to an end, um, they actually were setting up this Ebola research team with some internal funding that they had to try and document the care that was being provided and also see what sort of lessons we could learn from the data that we were collecting in the five Ebola treatment units that they were to set up during the course of the epidemic. And so I came back actually as director of the Ebola research team and we devised an incredibly complex system to get data out of the Ebola treatment units. In some cases we would read charts over the fence. In some cases we would send people in with GoPro cameras to take pictures of all the medical charts and then dunk those cameras in chlorine for 30 minutes and bring them out of the Ebola treatment unit uh, once they were sterilized. We'd load all of these images up onto laptops and then we'd have local data entry personnel who we hired and trained to enter all of the data from these images into databases. And then we had to clean and combine all of that data together and it was a tremendous amount of effort. But it proved to be really useful because it ended up giving us some of the first information that we had really about the epidemic and about the disease itself. So these, for instance, it gave us information on uh, the temporal uh, structure of the epidemic in terms of our five Ebola treatment units, how many patients we were seeing over time from uh, the fall of 2014 up through the fall of 2015, and how many of those patients ended up having Ebola, which are the ones in like red and orange here, and how many of those ended up dying from Ebola, which are the ones in red here. And so as you can see, most of the patients we actually saw in our Ebola treatment units didn't have Ebola because they had some other disease that looks very much like Ebola. And uh, we ended up caring for a lot of those patients. And still many of those patients ended up dying in our <coughs> Ebola treatment units because people die um, from a lot of different diseases in West Africa, as was pointed out, besides Ebola. It was really important to be able to provide care for them as well. We were also able to look through some GIS mapping at the geographical spread of our patients, so where our patients were coming from, uh, which uh, subdistricts had most number of patients that they were sending to us, which helped us track where the hot spots were in the epidemic, and also which ones had the highest mortality, which can help give us a sense of why some areas may have had higher mortality than other areas. We're also able to look at patient survival by age and found some really interesting things which were not really known to such a degree before, one of which is that children had some of the highest mortality. Their survival, this red curve is children under five, their survival was only about 18% overall in our Ebola treatment <coughs> unit, whereas um, patients who were in the 5 to 24 age range had survival of above 50%. Uh, patients who were over 45 had the second lowest survival, uh, around 30% or so in our Ebola treatment units. And so understanding how age affects patients' prognosis was really important. We were also able for the first time to actually look at the symptoms patients had with Ebola and how those changed over time. Before this, all of the information was really anecdotal and Ebola itself is called a viral hemorrhagic fever and it was thought that fever and bleeding are the most important parts of this disease. 
And what we found out is that actually fever is pretty important. It was present in a lot of patients, but still on any given day, only about 40% at most of patients had fever. Um, so it varied over the course of their illness. And fever was also really common in many of the patients who didn't have Ebola, who came into our Ebola treatment units. Uh, bleeding, for instance, was actually very uncommon. We only saw it on any given day in about 10%, 20% of the patients that we had in our Ebola treatment unit. We were able to look at things like how the virus um, grows within the body, and so this is actually looking at some of the curves of viral load in terms of how the um, virus propagates in the body and then how the body's immune system helps to start fighting off the virus, which is information that didn't really exist before. We're able to look at each of the different symptoms of this disease and actually figure out for the first time which are the symptoms that are most suggestive of Ebola. And from that, we were able to create an Ebola prediction score that allows us to actually assign a score to somebody based on their symptoms to tell us how likely it is that they are going to have Ebola. And patients with a higher score ended up being more likely to be diagnosed eventually with Ebola, while those with a lower score uh, <coughs> ended up being very unlikely to be diagnosed with Ebola. And this is really important in the context of running an Ebola treatment unit, because <coughs> when patients are coming into your Ebola treatment unit, on the one hand, you want to make sure that everyone who has the disease gets admitted because you don't want them going back to the communities and propagating and spreading disease in their community. On the other hand, you don't want to admit too many people to your Ebola treatment unit who don't have Ebola because then you're putting them at risk for getting Ebola in your Ebola treatment unit. So it's really kind of that triage decision is one of the hardest I've ever had to make as a physician in my career. And having some actual evidence-based screening tools, which we really lacked at the beginning of this epidemic, will prove really helpful, we think, in future epidemics. We were also able to develop prognostic models to help us determine which patients were more likely to die of the disease. Um, and we were able to turn both our kind of prediction scores and also our prognostic models into apps that could be used uh, at the bedside by clinicians in resource-limited settings to help them predict which patients are likely to have Ebola and which of those are most likely to die and therefore need the most help. Uh, during the time that I was director of our Ebola research team, we also ran a few different prospective trials in our Ebola treatment units. We ran a trial looking at a biosensor patch that could help remotely monitor vital signs in patients. So one of the hard things about an Ebola treatment unit is that all of the patients are in the high-risk zone, but the clinicians only go into the high-risk zone for about an hour at a time, because that's about as long as you can last in the PPE before you get overheated and have to come out. So the patients are mostly by themselves, which is the most strange setup for a hospital you've ever seen, because usually in hospitals, <coughs> patients are being cared for by family members, by nurses, by doctors around the clock. And in this setting, patients were mostly on their own. So being able to tell when patients were deteriorating, getting worse, was really difficult. We trialed this biosensor patch, which basically remotely projected vital signs from the patient through Bluetooth uh, to a handheld device in the ETU that then projected those to a laptop in the low risk zone where all the doctors and nurses were sitting uh, via Wi-Fi so we can measure vital signs. We ran some diagnostic trials looking at new rapid tests for Ebola that could help diagnose the disease quicker. And we also ran the first trial of a therapeutic drug for Ebola, the ZMAP trial, uh, which ended up being quite successful. Probably one of the things that I'm most excited about, though, coming out of the Ebola epidemic is this idea of the Ebola virus disease data sharing platform. And so as an organization, International Medical Corps, we ran five Ebola treatment units. We cared for uh, somewhere around 2,500 patients in those five Ebola treatment units. And we were able to collect our data from those units and study it to learn all sorts of interesting things. But at the same time, other organizations, <coughs> such as the Liberian Ministry of Health and Social Welfare, or the, Siber uh, or the Sierra Leonean military, or Doctors Without Borders, or Save the Children, or the US military and the British military, <coughs> were all running their own Ebola treatment units and all collecting their own data. And there really is no system set up for humanitarian organizations to share data and to collaborate in that way. The systems for them to coordinate together in terms of providing care are, only, are still relatively new, such as the cluster system that Michelle mentioned. Um, but really, no systems exist for sharing data. 
And yet, it's so fundamentally important for the world to have this information so that when we respond to the next epidemic, we can actually know more than when we responded to this epidemic. So this is a very long time in coming and very slowly developing project whereby all the organizations that responded to the Ebola epidemic in conjunction with the local ministries of health in West Africa are putting together this massive data sharing platform where all of the data collected during the epidemic will eventually be shared and made open access for use by the entire world and any researchers who want to study the data and learn from it. Um, it's required a lot of time and effort and funding and a ton of lawyers involved in it, unfortunately. Uh, but the goal is that eventually all of this individual patient data that was collected by all these different organizations will be cleaned and standardized and mapped together into a single repository that can then be used to do large sort of meta-analyses that can help provide research publications, new guideline, and inform policy for future epidemics. And if we can make this happen with Ebola, hopefully it's something that can happen in other types of humanitarian settings in the future. Um, but all of this kind of requires these partnerships between academic researchers, humanitarian responders, and local communities. These are three different groups that don't speak the same language, and I don't mean just literally the language that they speak. They think about things in very different ways, and bringing them all together uh, to work on research can be really difficult. I wrote this paper in the aftermath of the epidemic that was published in clinical trials called Academics are from Mars, Humanitarians are from Venus, Finding Common Ground to Improve Research During Humanitarian Emergencies. Uh, and it is really true, there was this uh, workshop that was done in the UK recently, which brought together humanitarians and academics and asked them to write what they thought about each other. And as you can see, they didn't have incredibly great <laughs> thoughts about each other's community. But in fact, in the end, what we really need to do in order to be able to improve future humanitarian responses and make sure that the next one we do a better job than the last one is really to be able to bring these different communities together, to be able to study what humanitarians do and to figure out better ways for how to do that in the future. And hopefully, um, that will result in less deaths and more survivors during future Ebola epidemics and other types of emergencies than we saw in this last one. So I'm going to stop there and bring up Dan and Michelle for a panel. And you guys can all ask us questions. Thank you. Thank you. First over here. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Um, when you were talking about the peer training and how you, you would train um, like local health workers to go out and then train <coughs> others, I was wondering if you came or what you thought about how effective it was. Because um, when I've done work in some developing countries, Yeah, that's a great question. So we we toyed with this idea, um, you know, and I and you know Adam and I have talked a lot about like humanitarian response and academics, and you know when we started this work, everybody wanted to help me. So I had a lot of very kind offers to come to Liberia and teach infection control, but it was such a, a fluid, unsafe environment that us flooding in a bunch of foreigners wasn't the best solution. And then the Liberian English dialect is um, is a unique one. And so even after eight years, I'll say something to a, a mom or a nurse, and they'll look at me, and then the nurse will repeat exactly what I just said, and then they'll go, yeah. And I'm like, really? I just said that. So the dialect is very interesting there. Um, but we did have to fight a little bit of a battle of perception. And so one of the things that our logistics support team did was that I wasn't as conscious of in the academic space. Like, you know, in Adam's presentation, you saw, you know, IMC is a brand right? Their brand is everybody, everybody's wearing their t-shirts, they all fit together, they're this organization that seems, you know, together, professional, and so we actually had to do that with our Liberian teams. So a lot of what we did with the training was 
not the technical knowledge, but professionalism, leadership, you know, when they're in the field, no matter what time of the day it is, they represent this effort. And so if it's after hours and they're seen, you know, slacking off or not washing their hands, they would be perceived as not, not experts and not serious. And so it's one of the things that our teams, I have to say, took to heart in a way that has just blown my mind. Like their ability to professionalize and say, we own this and we're going to be the leaders has been really amazing. <coughs> First of all, you, you, among the three of you, you represented Liberia and Sierra Leone, but I was wondering, among the three countries, was the response uh, in relation to the size of the epidemic in that country, or were there countries that were more disenfranchised in terms of the international response? And then the second question on whether there's any research happening about whether hand washing, which has become so prevalent, uh, whether it's... Uh, affecting other types of communicable diseases? Well, I'll just take the first part in terms of talking about the international response. And the reason you're seeing people representing Liberia and Sierra Leone up here is because we're all speaking English to you. And if this were a panel in France uh, and people on the panel were speaking French, they'd be talking about Guinea. Because largely the response was divided up very much uh, certainly along linguistic barriers with French-speaking countries responding much more in Guinea, which is a French-speaking country, and English-speaking countries responding in Liberia and Sierra Leone. But even then, it was divided up even more. Sierra Leone, which is a former British colony, the UK and British organizations were very <coughs> invested in the response in Sierra Leone, whereas Liberia, which is basically kind of US's own little colony in Africa, generally had a large, a much broader US response. And France, which was the former um, colonizer for Guinea, ended up providing a lot of the international response and certainly a lot of the funding for the response in Guinea. So that's part of the reason it was divided up that way. I think, in general, all three of those countries probably got a relatively even amount of response. I wouldn't say that there was one of those three that got more or less than the other. The epidemic had different dynamics in each country, and the willingness to accept uh, the basically support for the local government ranged a lot between those three countries, with it being sort of perhaps highest in Liberia, less so in Sierra Leone, and much less so in Guinea. So that influenced things as well. Um, and But outside of that, I think the response was pretty equivalent between those three countries. And your second question. Um, well, I've become the hand-washing warrior, as I'm now known. Um, so we, one of the main interventions during Ebola was teaching hand washing, proper hand washing. But then in the healthcare setting, it's one of the things that even here, if you go to a US hospital, is one of the recognized primary indicators of patient safety. That hand washing compliance is gonna reduce transmission in a healthcare setting by a huge amount. And so when we think about quality healthcare, it's a very easy thing for a setting like Liberia. It doesn't require fancy you know, imaging or technology. It requires bucket versions of sinks to have running water. And so one of the major focuses in the recovery has been on hand washing. And so we're actually, part of the data that we're tracking is we're tracking compliance with hand washing on a monthly and quarterly basis using WHO tools. And then we're comparing it as we track hospital outcomes on a monthly basis over a year. And so we're about seven months in. And so I'm excited to see what we find um, as we watch hand washing and, and outcomes over time. <laughs> this is for Dr. Levine and Dr. Nisterenko. So my work involves the pre-hospital setting. Um, how did you find that people were getting to the clinic? Or did, do you think there was a lot going on in the periphery, a lot of cases happening in the periphery that you weren't seeing? Or did you have any sense of that? Well, I'll talk from the Ebola treatment unit perspective, and maybe you can talk more from the general medical care system. Um, so it, it varied by different organization, by region, and by country. Um, but some organizations like International Medical Corps in Liberia, we created our own uh, Ebola ambulances, is what we called them. They were basically pickup trucks with kind of a structure on the back that were very easy to clean. And most of the surveillance was being done locally by local communities and by the Ministry of Health and Social Welfare. And so when they identified a potential case in their community, they would call us and we would send out our ambulance to pick up that case. 
in Sierra Leone, the ambulances were mostly run by the Ministry of Health, and so they would uh, send them themselves and bring the cases to our Ebola treatment units in Sierra Leone. In both countries and in all settings, a lot of people ended up coming on their own. They heard that there was an Ebola treatment unit there, and they would come on their own by foot or by bus or however they could get there. Um, but generally, the most common way was an ambulance that was either run by the Ministry of Health or run by one of the local organizations that were there. And then I think importantly in the health system, at least in Liberia and somewhat to my knowledge in Sierra Leone, is pre-Ebola, for example, the city of Monrovia only had six functioning ambulances and they belonged to individual healthcare facilities, uh, several of which were private faith-based and the faith-based and public uh, system in Liberia is pretty equivalent. There's not a big gap. And so the ability to actually even pre-Ebola deploy an ambulance was virtually non-existent. Um, we'd occasionally use it to move a patient from one facility to another, but you would actually go to the gas station with it and put gas in it to run it. And then there was also no central dispatch, which is so important in an EMS system. So that actually hampered the beginning of the response, is there was no way, if you were at home and you thought grandma had Ebola, there was no 911. And so one of the first sort of big wins was the cell phone companies in West Africa creating a free line for the public to be able to text in or call in. Um, my question is for Dr. Smith. How would you recommend when scientists... <coughs> Are you okay? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I guess, how would you recommend scientists consider all the social aspects of a disease when they don't fully understand the science behind it yet? Yeah, no, that's a hard question. I mean, I think one of the things that characterize both the international medical and local medical response and the local social response to Ebola was that everyone was kind of learning on the fly. I mean, as you've heard from all the all the panelists, um, this was new to, to everybody. Um, there were no, I mean, obviously they were experts in a certain sense, but there were no Ebola experts. People became Ebola experts in this whole endeavor. Um, you know, I, I, I think one of the things that Two things. One, one is was represented by that second to last slide I put up there, which is to sort of realize not only that that local people can learn to think like epidemiologists, but that epidemiologists and other kinds of public health and medical personnel need to learn to think like local people. So I think um, a, a sort of principle is that is that it, that I think is really important is that our first pass interpretation of what be, might be happening in a place that has us believe that what's happening doesn't make sense or is irrational or, or uh, is illogical. On second reflection, on better immersion, on better understanding of the context often looks very sensible. And so taking into account why something you don't want to have happen is happening looks, looks like it doesn't make sense from a kind of medical or public health point of view, probably is making sense from some social or cultural point of view and, and learning to kind of begin with that, casting aside that assumption that what they're doing is wrong and figuring out why they're doing it that's right and somehow working with that. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, certainly my own discipline and the social sciences in general were, I think, not well prepared and not as well utilized for all this. I mean, eventually I, they started to involve anthropologists and, and other social scientists in the endeavor, but um, I, I certainly don't put the blame on the local governments or on the international humanitarian world for n not involving us as much as I put the blame on us for not being ready for what our responses would be. If you think, for example, of, of, of burial, <coughs> I mean, there's, lo there's lots of anthropological information about burial rituals and burial rites, but if you actually dig into it, we didn't know very much about what people did with bodies when they died, right? And I think part of that comes from our own culture where for decades, probably centuries now, we've had a very different, and burial for us is this opaque thing that the body comes, it goes. The next thing you know, you see the, you see the open casket at a wake. You see it buried. There's a whole behind the curtain process that takes place that has kind of divorced it from the kind of face-to-face -face human reality that is still the case in places like West Africa, where burial and burial preparations are handled by family and by kin and by villages and so on. And so, there's a lot more that that anthropology and the social sciences could have done to bring to bear knowledge about those kinds of things. I think as responders to Oftentimes, our programming is not as flexible as it should be. And so one of the things I learned in doing this was we literally every day had to change what we were doing to adapt to something. And, I'm, and I've worked in Liberia for eight years, and literally every day something went, oh, that's why that's always been like that. 
you know, and that's with a lot of cultural knowledge and a lot of time there. And so we really had to be flexible in a way that I think humanitarian response sometimes isn't. You come with this, we've got to deliver this now on a short timeline, um, and not a bit of able to sort of open up our blinders and think like our colleagues. I'll say, even from the response perspective, probably one of the most helpful set of staff that we had in our Ebola treatment unit was our psychosocial support team. And even though they were called the psychosocial support team, they did a little bit of work providing psychosocial support to the patients in the Ebola treatment unit. The vast majority of what they did was communicating with communities and being able to explain to communities what was going on in our Ebola treatment unit to keep families in touch with their loved ones who are in the Ebola treatment unit. Perhaps the most important thing that we put in our Ebola treatment unit was plugs in the high risk zone so people could charge their cell phones and be able to actually call their family every day and tell them, I'm alive and they're actually providing care for me here as opposed to actually they're stealing my kidneys, which is what people thought was happening in some of the Ebola treatment units at some point. And so creating that bridge for connection with communities and explanation to communities about what was going on was super important. <coughs> and we wouldn't have been successful without that. Um, it seems to me as though there has been Ebola and Congo <coughs> and for many, many years. How much of the information from that experience were you able to um, hook into? Um, and if I, my memory is serving me right, there is a genetic change in the Ebola um, genome that makes it more infective. Um, and did you track that at all? So. Um it actually, one of the first things I did when I was responding initially to the Ebola epidemic was, you know, what I think any academic physician would do. I went on PubMed and searched for every article I could find on Ebola. And in fact, even though there had been two dozen outbreaks previously, there was actually almost, in fact, specifically about Ebola, there was not a single research study that had been published on the disease. How did not they keep a, it under control in, in the Congo? I mean, that's something that as a well, they, they, I looked at this, heard about it through um, BBC starting in the spring long before you guys had listened to Doctors Without Borders saying this is a disaster in the making. And I kept on thinking, um, I was in Nigeria, loss of fever was in Nigeria. They went back to the area that loss of fever was, 80% of the people were immune to it. What's going on in the Congo that might STEM. Well, there, there are a lot of different factors involved. And part of it, honestly, was that the prior outbreaks used, and mostly which were run by MSF on purpose because they had developed sort of the expertise to respond, they were mostly about containment. And essentially, most of the patients in those epidemics died. They didn't do very much to prevent their death. But they were able to contain the epidemic, partly through the initiation of public health measures, but largely because these were very isolated communities where they'd occurred previously. In eastern Congo, where it might be a two or three days walk to the nearest city, and nobody with Ebola is really walking two or three days to the nearest city, we saw something very different in West Africa, where from the villages where people first started getting Ebola in Guinea, they could travel to Conakry, Freetown, or Monrovia in a few hours by car. And that made a tremendous difference. It made it much harder to contain the epidemic initially. And MSF responded to the epidemic initially in Gekadu, Guinea, and implemented the same protocols that they had used in the last dozen epidemics they'd responded to across Africa. And those protocols <coughs> didn't work to contain it this time because it was able to spread beyond their control. And, and honestly, MSF did start calling out, asking for help early on. And it took a long time for the international community to start listening and to respond partly because everyone sort of hoped it would get better on its own. That was sort of like this uh, irrational hope on the side of the international community, I suppose, and also because the international community was scared. They were really scared to invest human resources into a response to something that they'd never done before. At least that's my perspective on it. And I would say the population mobility for this West African outbreak was the key. So again, the Congo outbreaks were so remote. The original outbreak in the Gekadu Forest sits on a tri-corner border that people walk over every day, and that people come down the road six hours to trade in Monrovia, which is the only port city 
that's close to this western, eastern part of Guinea, it's actually easier to get there than it is to get to Conakry. And so the challenge was in the beginning of the outbreak, so we actually, um, from Boston Children's, we placed pediatricians in Liberia full time to train the local pediatricians, and we had fellows there when this outbreak started. And so we were watching the situation as early as February 2014 to see if we needed to move our staff and move them out or do more training or do we, you know, do something. And so Liberia was initially very proactive. They actually set up a roadblock. And so out of the northern counties, MSF came in, set up one treatment unit, they shepherded everybody there, and then the county set up a roadblock. But it eventually became so bad, it overwhelmed the capacity to enforce that roadblock with such porous borders and poor security. And so the challenge was population mobility, and it was really underestimated at the beginning of this outbreak. And that's a challenge that's just going to grow into the future. There are going to be more roads, more plane trips, more mobile <coughs> populations in the future. And so the next Ebola epidemic is probably going to look more like this one than like the older ones in eastern Congo. Um, so Dr. Levine was talking a little bit about kind of the challenges of creating um, like a triage protocol. Um, because not all of the symptoms were well known um, and really not much of the treatment was well known. Um, and then Dr. Smith was talking a little bit about how home care was kind of inevitable in certain circumstances. Um, what are actually some of like the treatments that first came out um, as like basic um, methods of care um, and like how did those kind of evolve um, over almost like trial and error and like were some of those um, treatment protocols more or less like culturally acceptable. Um, I know obviously um, on the other end of things um, changing uh, the burial of the bodies was something that was really cultural um, needed to be more cu culturally sensitive. Um, <coughs> did you run into that with treatment at all and how did the treatment <coughs> kind of, like evolve throughout the epidemic? Um, so I would say the, some of the initial work, you know, in the beginning of the outbreak, as uh, Dr. Levine was saying, the availability of Ebola treatment units was low. And so in August, when there was 800 cases a week, there were only three open treatment units in all of Liberia. And so a lot of patients ended up either outside the unit, in the hospital <coughs> facilities, or at home. And so a lot of the data coming out post-outbreak is that those who were able to orally hydrate, so drink, 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 um, for days before they went into the more severe illness phase actually had better outcomes. And so some of that oral hydration piece is really important. This also, just as Adam said, you know, MSF prior to this outbreak had been the only international responder, the only one willing to take the risk to manage this disease. And one of the risks is to the healthcare workers. So I think it can't be underestimated um, what Adam mentioned in his talk that the healthcare workers can only be in the suits for 45 minutes to an hour. Your goggles fog up, you're losing about a liter of fluid and sweat because it's 100 degrees in Liberia and you're in an airtight plastic suit. And so your ability to function safely in double gloves and a space suit to put a needle into somebody else risks the healthcare workers and <coughs> breaching their suits. So prior to this outbreak, IV fluids had never been used because there wasn't enough manpower and there wasn't enough ability to maintain the safety. And so that was one of the biggest things that evolved during this outbreak was providing IV fluid therapy, which I think Adam probably knows the logistical challenges of even better than I do. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> what we ended up using were very basic types of care that um, actually had largely been drawn from prior responses to cholera epidemics. Um, basic things like giving oral rehydration solution, putting in IVs when people were not able to drink and giving them fluid through intravenously. We also gave people treatment for other diseases that uh, they were more likely to have, even if they were coming into an Ebola treatment unit, like malaria and typhoid, et cetera, which we do have treatments for. And then providing them with good nutrition, because we know that for all diseases, poor nutrition leads to higher mortality. And so it was just some of these very basic things that we were able to provide in Ebola treatment units, things that were locally available, that were not that expensive, and that we thought, at least from prior, uh, from other types of diseases, might be helpful. Um, but we didn't really know if anything we were giving necessarily was helping. We think it was, a lot of it, but we don't know for sure. And that's a lot of kind of where we're analyzing the data from this most recent epidemic to see which things we did actually made an impact and help patients. 
Um, so I would just, just say one thing from a kind of social perspective on that question. I mean, I think one of the things that happened in the minds of Sierra Leoneans, Guineans, and, and Liberians was the, the, the witnessing and then the sort of absorbing of the transformation from what, what to them looked like a vicious cycle, meaning everybody who goes into these places dies, why would I want to go there? To a virtuous cycle, right, where people began to perceive that that if you that I mean, and the, the vicious cycle was of course compounded by the fact that early on there weren't enough treatment centers, that everybody who did go to the hospital died, and the caretakers died, and so on. Over time, as the as the, as the response ramped up, it became possible for people to be convinced by messages saying you should, if you have these symptoms, you should come to a center. And as the information started to filter back to rural, to communities that were affected, that people were surviving. You know, then it's easier to convince people that the message that they're getting from the public health authorities is one that they can follow. And then from an acceptability of treatment standpoint, the perception in West Africa is if you go to the doctor and they don't give you an injection or go home with like a bag of medications, you, your doctor was a crackpot. Like they didn't know what they were doing. You have to do something. And so for families to be able to understand that Patients were getting injections, meds were being given, meals were being served, which is often not the case in hospitals, made a, a, also a big difference in the community perceptions. And we're doing a lot of community follow-up on their perceptions of satisfaction and, and quality in the healthcare system right now. And the number one response we get is, is if the physician or nurse does something to the patient soon enough, if they've been given a treatment soon enough that they can see with their own eyes. So we probably need to wrap up now. We'll hang out here for a little bit if people have other questions. But I really want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Really appreciate it. And thank our panel here again for coming down and for talking to everybody.